to this uh, House Committee on Labor to Order. Uh, we have a quorum present. Uh, we have minutes of the last meeting in front of you from March 27th, 2019. Representative Vogel, do you, would you move the minutes? I will, Mr. Chair. Okay, the motion's made. Uh, any additions, corrections, comments? All in favor? Approval of the minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. We'll get the minutes done. Uh, before we get going on the bills today, we've got uh, some new players here. I'd like to welcome Representative Nathan Nelson uh, to the committee from Pine County. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, a couple new staffers. Uh, introduce yourselves, please. A little something about you. Pressure. Yeah, thank you. Michael Molnar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, committee Administrator, live in St. Paul. Something about me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Marta James. I'm in House Research. I'll be covering this committee, the labor employment issues, and something about me. I live in Cottage Grove, <laughs> so happy to be here. Kyle Smith, Committee Legislative Assistant. Happy to be here. I'm from St. Cloud. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first bill up today is uh, House File 3222, Representative Becker Finn, uh, to your bill. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, the first time I've uh, had a bill up in the Labor Committee, so it's it's good to be here. It's good to get some extra steps coming over the Capitol again, too. Uh, so House File 3222 uh, would require that diaper changing stations uh, be installed in buildings with publicly accessible bathrooms. And you could either have changing stations in both the men's and women's restrooms or in a uh, non-gender specific uh, accessible bathroom. Excuse me, uh, uh, Representative. I didn't move the bill. Oh, but, uh, sorry, Mr. I, Chair. I do move House File 3222. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, so this bill is was actually uh, brought to me. Uh, the idea came from a constituent who is here with me today, uh, Alice. Uh, like me, she is a mom, and uh, it would really be great if uh, all businesses and uh, publicly accessible buildings were already doing this. But the reality, if any of you have uh, had young children in recent years, is that uh, many places do not. Uh, and so that's really what, what this is about, is really bringing this forward to tell businesses kind of loud and clear that this is what people expect and want um, to see in, in businesses. And so I, I encourage you, if you don't have young kids yourself and haven't personally experienced this, I encourage you to talk to parents in your district because uh, I have so many stories from so many parents. I don't think I've had um, quite so much feedback from folks when I posted online about a bill that I was carrying. People are much more excited about this than my chronic wasting disease bills. Uh, uh, as, so as many of you know, I'm a parent. My kids are nine and five and a half. Uh, and my husband and I were continually surprised at how many places uh, did not have uh, changing stations in the bathrooms, particularly in the men's bathroom. So this is also sort of a parity issue to make sure that dads can be parenting just as much as moms. And I will add that other cities and states have already enacted bills like this. Uh, there's cities in Oklahoma as well as uh, New York and some other cities throughout. Uh, cities and states have been discussing this as well, um, as well as the federal buildings already have this requirement and was passed uh, bipartisanly. Um, fill out your bingo card. Uh, and signed into law by President Obama. So with that, I want to introduce uh, my testifiers. Uh, so first I have uh, Alice Lohr. Like I said, Alice is a mom uh, too, and she was the one that brought this to my attention, and she uh, has some, uh, some words to share with you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak on House File 3222. Um, my name is Alice, and like uh, Representative becker Finn said, I am a mom to a six-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old who is currently still in diapers. This bill is really valuable to me and all the parents and caregivers I know because we've all had this shared negative experiences that would have been made better by having changing tables in bathrooms. So I wanted to share some stories um, from friends and stories of 
what I've experienced. Um, but first, I would just wanted to share about what uh, parents affectionately call the blowout. And if you have had a child, you should know what this is. And if you don't, you are really lucky. Um, <laughs> For those of you who are lucky enough and don't know what a blowout is, it's basically when your baby poops uh, so powerfully that it goes all the way up the child's back. So the first time, <laughs> first time we experienced this with our oldest, we were shocked and honestly paralyzed. We didn't know what to do or where to even start. And that year we threw away a lot of onesies. So imagine dealing with this at a restaurant in the middle of a Minnesota winter. Winters are long here, and families are desperate to get out with kids. Uh, before we lived in Minnesota, we've only been here a little over two years, we lived in Los Angeles. So coming here was a shock. Um, I didn't realize how cold and cloudy it was. I'm originally from Wisconsin, but Minnesota winters are definitely harsher. And so, for six months, you're stuck in the house, and as a parent of two young children, we are itching to get out like most people. And so we go out to dinner, and parents that I've talked to who have had this experience have said they've done things like change the baby in the booth where they're eating, or they've rushed through dinner and waited to change the baby at home because in the middle of winter, there's so much snow on the bathroom floor that they don't want to just change their child on the bathroom floor. Other friends have said that they just left that restaurant, never came back, knowing that uh, there were no changing tables. I have friends who have laid the baby's blanket on a dirty floor to change the baby, and then considering it's winter, no longer have a clean blanket to take the baby back to the car. Um, other friends have plastered the bath bathroom floor with paper towels before laying the diaper pad down and changing the baby. Um, in my own experience, when my son was two and, a, two and a half months, we took a vacation to North Myrtle Beach and we were walking along the boardwalk and none of the public spaces had changing tables. And so I had no choice but to lay down my sweater onto the sand and change my son there. And we all know that sand gets everywhere. And so that tainted that experience for me, making me never want to go to North Myrtle Beach again. Um, I really feel passionate about this legislation um, because I've known what it feels like to com be completely defeated as a mom who just wants to get out of the house um, and then suddenly get to a place that doesn't have a place that I could change my child. Um, the other thing I wanted to note was that children generally are not potty trained until age three, which means a lot of my friends and families stop going to certain businesses for at least three years because they know that that business does not have a changing table. Parents are in survival mode the first few years of the baby's life and they don't have the time or capacity to contact their legislator or speak up at the business about this problem. They really just want to survive and so they change the baby and leave and don't return. The only reason I was able to bring this up, like uh, Representative Becker Finn said, was that um, she literally came knocking on my door um, while I was on maternity leave with a one month old. And so I told her to come in and um, shared this thought with her that I had at 3 a.m. in the morning about changing table problems. And this is how this came to be. Otherwise, most parents just grit their teeth and bear it um, and then don't look back once their kids are potty trained. Um, again, my husband has uh, also frequently taken the kids to the bathroom to change them only to find no changing table in a really dirty bathroom. I've never been in a men's room, so I don't know how dirty they are, but <laughs> Um, he has said that they are dirtier than women's rooms. Um, and typically, he doesn't even want to use the bathroom in there, let alone change our children. Living in Minnesota, I uh, appreciate the governor's um, priorities with children and families. And I think that we could be uh, ahead of the curve here in the US by supporting families, mothers, fathers, single parents, by making it one step easier um, to be a family, to parent these children um, by having changing tables available in public spaces. Um, I feel like life is hard enough. We all know that, especially when you're raising young children. And we can help families by removing just this one more barrier um, to being successful families. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alice Lohr. Do you have another testifier? Go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. 
So, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Katie Kazimanel. Um, I am a resident of District 42B. I am also an associate professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, and I'm the director of the University of Minnesota Rural Health Research Center. So, as a I, I, most of my work that I conduct is on women, children, and families, and I do a lot of work in, in rural Minnesota and in rural America. From a public health perspective, access to basic sanitary needs for babies in public locations is absolutely essential. This bill ensures that. From a geographic equity perspective, across greater Minnesota, we sometimes have more problems accessing infrastructure and services, and being able to have a place to change your baby is a very basic piece of infrastructure that should be available to all Minnesotans. It also ensures gender equity. This bill would ensure that there are changing stations in all restrooms so that all parents and caregivers of all genders can take care of diapering needs. I also support this bill as the parent of two children. My kids no longer need diapers, they're nine and 11, but both of them just finished a babysitting training course this past weekend, and in the course, diapering featured prominently. That was a big part of the skill that they needed to learn to take care of young children. And they were told in the course that if they have a kid out at a park, or if they're out at a mall, or if they're out you know, playing with a kid somewhere that has a, a diapering need, that they can go to the restroom to change the baby. <coughs> right now, I didn't quite have the heart to tell them that that's not actually true in most places. I didn't want to frighten them away from their very first babysitting experiences. But I really think that um, this bill is a very basic, <coughs> it ensures that a very basic need is met for all Minnesotans and um, with attention to geographic and gender equity across our state. I think this bill makes sense. I think it should pass. And if you have any questions, I welcome them. Thank you. Thank you, Katie Cosimano. <coughs> uh, any questions to the testifiers or the author? Representative Dedman. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would this also include hospitals and uh, colleges, universities? wherever public has access? Uh, yes. Okay. And uh, Mr. Chair, just a, kind of, just a comment. Uh, I had my daughter uh, had to assist me to be a driver for me because I had to take some tests at, the, at a hospital recently. And they had no area there for, to uh, perform pumping for, mm -hmm. for nursing purposes. So, uh, and that, this is a hospital. So they had to actually take a room that was usually used by a patient to uh, perform, so my daughter could have some privacy to uh, pump for our eight-month-old uh, granddaughter. So, just a just a comment there. So. Thank you, Representative Detmer. Representative Cagle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Becker Finn. When when I signed onto this bill, I I affectionately called it my my husband never has an excuse again while we're in public, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you, and um, just to share some of the most um, the some of the weirdest places I've had to change diapers, in a a booth at Hardee's in Hinkley, and on the library at the governor's mansion, mm -hmm. on the floor of the library in the governor's mansion. No changing tables at the governor's mansion. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Cagle. Re Representative Zhang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Jamie Becker. Friend, uh, you have to excuse me. I don't have any kids yet. So thank you for having uh, changed any kids in public yet. But I'm just curious because I've been to uh, institutions where uh, what they consider is a changing station is just a metal table. And I've been to places where they have those things where you pull out, pull down. And so how would you define, or do we, uh, or would that be good enough to be considered uh, a changing station? Representative Cagle? <laughs> or Becker Finn, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we don't define it in here. I mean, I think in the common understanding of what a changing station it is, is kind of that, that pull down, you know, and we have fancy metal ones in the capital, but they're typically the plastic, you know, Koala Care, whatever the, the brand is. Thank you. Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> is there any consideration if the bathrooms are like older, historic, and there's no place to put one? Representative <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, I mean, we did we did think of that, and I you know there are other ways that um, in building co you know if it's not physically feasible, I suppose uh, you know <laughs> we could look at that. Oh, Mr. Chair, I've actually have installed these things, um, and I, I my personal opinion, some of the older ones I've, I've got to use a visual display here, but they pivoted the long way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're much less safe because it creates a greater weight. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, if you take, you have to take into account some of the newer construction. If it wasn't taken into account when it was built, there's nothing back there to anchor into, especially if it's steel studs. And, and I would, I mean, take it for what it's worth, but we, it's no good when they fall off. I actually just took the two of the vertically hinged out of our church and put in the horizontally hinged. And then the third bathroom, there was nowhere to put it. The wall wasn't wide enough. So we didn't put one in there. We bought it, but we didn't put it in. But just something to take into consideration. I do agree, though. Blowouts are bad. <laughs> Representative becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I appreciate that, that, that feedback. Um, and now I know that there's a member of the legislature who has actually installed one of these. So that's very, very helpful Maybe. information to know. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, Representative Fabian. Vogel, I'm sorry. And then Fabian. Representative Vogel. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Relative to the uh, question was just asked, and um, uh, one of the buildings that we occupy was is, is a really old building that's grandfathered with really small bathrooms. Is there some other place in the um, statute or code that allows for things like this? This looks like a pretty general statement, and I'd hate to see somebody out of compliance because they just can't make it work with the limited space. Um, so just curious if, if it's in code someplace else or if indeed maybe this, I don't know where this goes from here, but if maybe there needed to be a little amendment referring to something that leaves an out for somebody to, to be able to look at this and comply. At this point, I'll remind the uh, committee that this will be re-referred to the Early Childhood Finance and Policy Division. Representative becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I would d defer to research. I've been working with research on, on this bill. You know, we modeled it a little bit out, out of, off of what other states were doing, but um, certainly open to making sure that we're not putting people in an impossible situation. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative becker Finn, um, I, and I apologize, I came in late. I had constituents. Is this for new construction or all existing bathrooms? Representative becker Finn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is across the board. So both. Okay. Um, so what's the cost of a changing station? Representative becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Installed. Chair. So the, the equipment itself is around $150. Um, you know, I, I imagine the fancy metal ones we have here in the Capitol are probably more expensive than that. Um, mm -hmm. I know the, the research that I've done is it's a, between 1,000 to 1,500, depending upon, I suppose, how many bathrooms you have to do and where they're located. Representative he's, he's Fabian, are you looking for an estimate? Well, <laughs> 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 that's uh, maybe it'd give you a, a lot of labor there the way it sounds. So, okay, so who pays for this? Representative Becker Finn. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, it would, it would be if it was a public building, then it's, it's, there's going to be a cost to it. I do, do recognize that. I have, um, started conversations with folks about um, looking at uh, letting people um, deduct it tax-wise so they can, you know, kind of get credit for investing in their, in their business. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I, you know, I appreciate what you're doing. I used to change diapers on my boys on the floor of the minivan outside the mm -hmm. buildings. Um, so our cafes and gas stations in small towns, those are all public. I don't know how many, well, you've, you've had some experience in at least central Minnesota. I wouldn't say northern Minnesota based on where I live, but <laughs> um, no, you have to even at Lake of the Woods. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of these small town cafes and, mm -hmm. and so forth. If you've gone into them, I mean, folks, there's not room in them for them to put them in there. And I'm concerned that we're creating this with really good intentions. I understand all that, but um, for example, just in Rosa, one of the cafes has been for sale for about two and a half years, and they can't find a buyer. And I'm just concerned that this type of stuff is going to make it 
difficult for a few small business owners who, in my, in my opinion, are, are really important to the viability of our small rural towns. So what kind of accommodations are we going to make for them? Representative Beckerfin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I've made the trip from the Twin Cities up to the Cass Lake Bemidji area many times, and I can still tell you which gas stations and which restaurants had changing tables and which ones didn't because we we then didn't bring our business to those ones that that didn't so i think there is there is a benefit to to businesses i mean i i i hear you and i expected that to be um some of the feedback and and as mentioned you know this is the first stop and you know the next stop is in the fi finance committee and um you know, I'm happy to, to work with folks, and I think especially, you know, knowing the, the, the background now that, that we have uh, here in this committee, um, if there's a way to make sure, because the intention is certainly not to, to ding our small businesses, but I, I do think it's important um, kind of statewide that this be looked at. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to be clear, too, then, who has enforcement on this? Representative Which becker -Fan. Agency. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it'd be uh, whoever enforces all. It's a, just it's under the building code. Okay. One more representative, yep. Fabian. One. Well, I guess there's my hook. I'm getting it. Um, <laughs> so then, what would be the penalty if uh, a building inspector came out and they found that you didn't have this? Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We don't delineate that in the um, in this bill. But representative if, Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Representative Becker Finn, you're putting this in here, though. So, what are, what what is the agency currently doing for penalties on something like similar to this? Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know that we have anybody from the agency here. I imagine it might be similar to. Um, we do have somebody from the agency. <laughs> I think they would be best suited to answer that. It's it's hard to think of what exactly a similar. Item would be, I, I suppose, maybe some of the things that are required under the ADA would be similar types of things as far as um, accessibility. If uh, there's uh, accurate information on this subject matter, uh, could someone from the agency please come forward? Identify yourself and please help us. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Scott McClellan. I'm the director of construction codes and licensing for the state of Minnesota. So as written, the, the bill says that the code shall require, and the building code only applies in new construction or in additions in those affected areas or in remodeled areas. So as written, it would not apply to existing buildings. I have a question for Representative or, uh, Mr. McClellan. Uh, is that only when a building permit is uh, drawn? Mr. Chair, committee members, yes. So if someone were to want to construct a building and the code were enforced in that particular area, they'd have to obtain a building permit, and then the building inspector would verify that this fixture was present and it was in the correct location within the the toilet room. So as, as this is written, it's only on projects going forward, no reaching back on an, any existing Mr. Chair, properties. yes, that is correct. This would only be for new projects going forward or remodeled elements of existing buildings. So if a toilet room were undergoing a renovation, then it would have to meet in all respects with the accessibility code and this device as well. Thank you for that clarity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Representative Mecklen. <clears throat> Actually, I, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question for you. So, so in, in, in much of our building, when we pull permits, it'll trigger certain things like septic uh, compliance, um, smoke alarms, and so forth. As you said, it's a, a permit would trigger this if it's a remodel. If I'm remodeling the dining room, say, of a cafe, would that trigger this that I'd have to do this in the bathroom if I wasn't planning on doing anything in the bathroom? Yes, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, Mr. if you were renovating something that wasn't triggering the restroom, you would not be obligated to go to the restroom. If, for example, however, you were converting uh, some low occupant space into something high occupancy where you needed additional toilet fixtures, then we'd have to be looking at the restroom and upgrading that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be looking at anything other than the area you are renovating. Thank you. Any further questions? Any input? 
Further input? Okay, seeing none, uh, I renew my motion that House File 3222 be re referred to the Early Childhood Finance and Policy Division. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. The motion does prevail. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do uh, want to acknowledge that even though issues regarding diapers and blowouts may be somewhat humorous, I uh, do appreciate uh, the serious discussion here today and moving this forward. So thank you. <laughs> Representative Sundin. Thank you, Chair Cagle. I'll try to get the name straight. <laughs> Okay, uh, we've got uh, House File 3211, I uh, move uh, to the General Register. This is uh, 3211, Repeal State Occupational Standards for Crane Operation Certificates, Training and Inspection, to be replaced with the 2018 Federal OSHA Standards for Crane Operator Training, Certification and Licensing. Adopting the more restrictive federal standards via state rulemaking procedures Minnesota Statutes 2018, Sections 14.386 and 14.388 will put Minosha in line with similar OSHA programs in other states. We have uh, experts from the department uh, to testify and uh, clarify uh, this piece of legislation. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Hi. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representatives, for allowing me to speak today. My name is Jim Kruger. I'm the Minnesota Occupational Safety and Health Administration, <coughs> Min OSHA Enforcement Director. House File 3211 is a Department of Labor and Industry technical bill that repeals the Crane Certification Standard in Minnesota Statutes 182.6525 and 182.659, Subdivision 1A, because it is no longer needed. In 2005, the bill requiring crane operators to be certified in order to operate cranes that are five tons or greater. In November of 2018, Federal OSHA published a final rule in the Federal Register clarifying requirements for crane operators. Under the final rule, employers are required to train operators as needed to perform assigned crane activities. Training is required for crane operators greater than one ton. The rule also requires crane operators to be certified or licensed and received ongoing training as necessary to operate new equipment. Operators can be certified based on the crane's type and capacity or type only. On November 4th of 2019, Min OSHA adopted this federal standard, Cranes and Derricks in Construction, Operator Qualifications Final Rule, through the rulemaking process. This standard is more restrictive and then the Minnesota State Statute on Crane Operations. Therefore, the department is proposing to repeal the crane certification standard in sections 182.6525 and 182.659, subdivision one. I ask the committee to support this House File 3211 and can stand for any questions. Is there anyone in the audience who would wish to testify on House File 3211? Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Oh, Representative Fabian. Thank you. So did, was there public testimony during the rulemaking process? In regards to the Federal Register, we followed the rulemaking process, which was adopted at the federal level, went through that. We did publish it following our rulemaking process, put it out. We received no comments. Okay. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, so I, if I heard you right, the federal, new federal standards are, are higher than our old standards that we're repealing. And so therefore, we're, we're having a higher standard going forward than we had before. Mr. Kruger. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. In regards to the standard, the federal standard is more restrictive. Typically, it starts out one ton and greater, where the old standard was five ton. Representative so, Madam Fabian? Chair, so, oh, Madam Chair, so that, like I said, it's a more restrictive. It's a, it's, it creates better safety for our for our people on the job sites. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, walk me through some of the more restrictive. Uh, Standards. What what's going to what's going to happen to uh, a, a crane operator? What are they going to have to do different? Mr. Kruger. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. In regards to the statute, the statute itself requires certification. The Minnesota statute that'll continue. That was on five tons and greater. The federal standard, which we've adopted and gone through the rulemaking, that's at one ton and greater. The certification is basically the same. We've received input from the construction industry that they want this because of they do work not only in Minnesota, Wisconsin, but all the other states. This would equalize all the OSHA programs across the country. Any other questions from the committee? Oh, Representative Meckler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I did actually talk to Landwehr Construction, which that's a big part of their business is cranes. They did not have an issue with this, so. Any other questions? Seeing none, Representative Sundin renews his motion that House File 3211 be placed on the General Register. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion prevails. Next up is House File 3212. Representative Sundin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll move uh, that uh, House File 3212 be moved to the General Register. This makes a technical change for conformity with federal law regarding apprenticeships. Uh, we have uh, experts from the department uh, willing to f uh, fill us in on the details of this. Welcome to the Welcome to the committee. If you'd like to state your name for the record and continue with or proceed with your testimony. Yes. <clears throat> Go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Labor Committee. My name is Rosalind Robertson. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. <clears throat> I'm here to speak on behalf of House File 3212, a department policy to adopt federal apprenticeship conformity provisions. The department mission is to ensure Minnesota work and living environments are equitable, healthy, and safe. It does this through compliance related occupational safety and health, workers' compensation, construction code, and licensing labor standards and registered apprenticeship. The Department of Labor and Industry is recognized as the state registration agency by virtue of the Minnesota <clears throat> Apprenticeship Act, Chapter 178, but also by the United States Department of Labor Office of Apprenticeship. To maintain its federal recognition status, the Department of Apprenticeship Regulations must have conformity with the current federal minimum requirements. In January of 2017, the U.S. Department of Labor adopted rules in Title 29, Code of Federal Regulations, Section 30, which updated equal employment opportunity protections for apprentices to further advance diversity and inclusion. It prescribes affirmative action efforts apprenticeship sponsors must take to ensure equal opportunity for apprentices and those who apply to be apprentices. This rule was last updated in 1978. Previous 29 CFR 30 regulations prohibited discrimination in apprenticeship on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, and sex. The updated federal regulations extend protections against discrimination based on disability, age 40 years or older, sexual orientation, and genetic information. 
These regulations also provide a set of strategies and protections for outreach and retention to improve apprentice, apprentice diversity. They require that apprenticeship sponsors assign EEO responsibility to an individual who will be responsible for program compliance, maintain an environment free of discrimination and harassment, utilize outreach, utilize outreach recruitment and selection strategies to reach all qualified applicants, communicate EEO policy and complaint procedures to our apprentices and keep records for the registration agency to confirm sponsor compliance with the regulations. The department continues to provide technical assistance to any new or existing sponsor in developing and administering programs consistent with the federal EEO requirements. Today, there are more than 12,000 Minnesotans registered and actively completing their apprenticeship training in nearly 200 active programs in various industries, including agriculture, advanced manufacturing, construction, healthcare, information technology, public sector, um, transportation, and utilities. Registered apprenticeship is a time-tested earn-as-you-learn model that has served as a successful pathway for many thousands of Minnesotans to develop skills in demand, in high demand areas, produces a middle-class lifestyle, and a family-sustaining income. However, despite recent gains in the workforce, diversity and apprenticeship, women and people of color remain distinctly underrepresented in the registered apprenticeship ranks. Retirement and state demographic trends indicate and inform us of the importance and need of diversity and inclusion strategies to meet the 21st century workforce needs. This legislation seeks to bring Minnesota Apprenticeship Act under Minnesota statute chapter 178 into conformity with the Code of Federal Regulations, Title VII, Title 29, Section 30. I strongly urge the committee to support House File 3212 and I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you. And um, is there anyone, in, if you'd like to proceed with your, or do you wanna ask questions first? Is there a question of the test fire? Um, we can go with the, if you'd like to state your, um, continue oh, with I'm sorry, I'm John Aiken, um, uh, Madam Chairwoman, um, and I'm just here for technical questions. I'm the Director of uh, Labor Standards and Apprenticeship with the Department. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Representative Nelson? Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, so, I get this right, the, we're basically, we're complying with the federal laws and we're basically adding some yeah, classes to the EEOC part is the simple explanation, I, I guess, that I'm, that I'm being asked by somebody from the audience of that question, so. Madam Chair, Representative Nelson, that is correct. Thank you. Representative Mecklen. So just out of curiosity, but thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the date of January 18, 2017, has there been any update to the federal since then, or I mean, why was the date this date picked? Has there not been any changes since then? Ms. Ms. Robertson? Madam Chair, Representative, um, January 17th is the day that the US DOL adopted the change in their regulations. Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Has there been any changes by them since, is, I guess is my question. Madam um, Chair, Representative, no. No additional changes has been made. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that, is, is there any other questions? Is there anybody else who wishes to testify? <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Adam Hansen. I'm with the Associated Builders and Contractors of Minnesota. Uh, we represent about 350 contractors, uh, commercial and industrial folks, and, and related uh, industries as well. Now, they're the folks that build our schools, our multifamily housing, renewable energy projects, and, and the like. Um, ABC and our members have a, have a few concerns with the bill as written, um, as well as a, a significant area that we think the department and this legislature should look at to actually conform to some federal apprenticeship standards where we're not already. Uh, the compliance state listed that was uh, briefly mentioned earlier encompasses uh, the Obama administration's apprenticeship uh, ratio regulations that were, uh, and a circular that the Department of Labor um, instituted uh, in the final days uh, of, of that administration. And those changes um, were issued with no public notice or uh, opportunity for public comment at the federal level. Uh, the current administration, Department of Labor, rescinded uh, those regulations in that circular that went out uh, in, in January of 17. So it's curious that the, that the bill as written would institute a, a compliance document, a circular that's no longer in effect at the federal level. Um, those regulations as written when they were in effect had a significant impact on existing apprenticeship programs um, nationwide as well as some here in Minnesota. Uh, we would encourage the committee to uh, amend the, the, the bill as written to incorporate changes that have gone into effect up until present day or, or in 2020 um, so the contractors in the state can know which federal rules and regulations are gonna have to comply with on the apprenticeship side of things. Uh, one specific critique we hear from our members about the current state of apprenticeship rules and regulations is for the wage determination and that graduated wage scale in apprenticeship programs. Current state law and the rules surrounding those wage determinations say that the wage scale should be based on uh, the state prevailing wage rate where the contractor is domiciled. Now that doesn't, and that applies to contractors who might not even work on prevailing wage project, projects. It, it would apply to contractors who, who solely do market rate work their apprentices and that wage rate would be determined based on the state prevailing wage rate. We're unaware of any other states or even the federal government um, that administers its federal apprenticeship programs um, that require wages to be set based off of either state prevailing wage or federal Davis-Bacon rates. Instead, we think an, each employer should have the flexibility to set what wage rate should their apprentices be based off of as they move up that graduated wage scale. For example, a contractor could take the average journey worker wage rate at their shop and say this is what we're gonna base each apprenticeship um, standard off of and then have that wage scale gradually up toward that average wage rate. And then when the journey worker graduates, that, appren or that apprentice graduates to become a journey worker, they can get paid whatever the, the shop um, requires. Uh, since no two contractors are alike in any industry, um, a one-size-fits-all prevailing wage determination isn't exactly the most flexible. And that's why we don't see uh, too many contractors, especially on the merit shop side, um, having registered apprenticeship programs because of that prevailing wage tie-in as well as the compliance factor um, that goes along with it. Now, ABC and our Construction Education Foundation does have an apprenticeship program with the state, and some of our contractors do it because it makes uh, business sense, it's good for their employees, um, and it's good for how they train, but not everybody wants to do that. There's more than one way to upskill a worker in a whole host of industries, and we think we should recognize that and allow more folks to take advantage of registered apprenticeship um, as it works for their business. So if, if the goal of this administration and the legislature is to promote registered apprenticeship, we think um, changing that wage scale determination as well as the, um, the, the conformity date in the bill would be a good first step in that direction. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is there any questions? Uh, Representative Mecklen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Hansen, I just asked the question if anything has changed since January 18 of 2017 on the federal rules, and I was told no, but I think you just said that it has been changed since. Can you clarify that for me, please? Mr. Hansen. Madam Chair and Representative Mecklen, yes. Yeah, so, and I forget the date that the circular was issued, but I, I think it was January 9th, uh, the Department of Labor uh, in 2017 issued a circular um, saying that they're going to be rolling back some certain apprenticeship ratios um, re and regulations related to that that would have an effect going forward on certain apprenticeship programs and how many journey workers to apprentices they could have on their job site and so forth. Going forward under the current administration, uh, the then Secretary Acosta rescinded that circular, so it's no longer in effect. But the bill as written would kind of take us back in time, so to speak, to a time where that circular and those related rules were in effect if that makes sense. Madam Chair. Representative Mecklen. So what you're saying is it has changed. I guess the bottom line is there has been changes since 
January 18 of 2017 that this is then sidestepping. Mr. Hanson. Madam Chair, Representative Beckland, yes. Um, thank you. Is there any other questions? Is there anybody else that wishes to testify on this bill? Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Um, for the record, my name is Rick Keller. Unofficially represent the twice exceptional people with print disabilities. Come to testify at the committee uh, today, Labor Committee, Wednesday the 19th to 2020, specifically regarding House File 3212. Some time ago, I uh, decided to take on uh, Equal Opportunity, the EEOC, I heard it mentioned, but they didn't say what it was at this meeting, the Equal Opportunity Employer. And it takes two, year, two, two years to get a letter to sue, including the Department of Labor Industry, uh, a union, and a few others. However, uh, I decided not to bite the hand that feeds you. You know, I gave my heads up because they didn't have affirmative action program at that time, and perhaps they didn't have to. But as I dig into affirmative action programs, I see the word discrimination, but to the Dep Department of Labor Industry, they're willing to yield to the question through the chair regarding harassment. Uh, would they be willing to speak about harassment? It relates to the U.S. Department of Labor as they look at harassment. As you know, the Minnesota legislature just refortified their discrimination and harassment policy here. I, it's my understanding that harassment is just best practice. But how does the Department of Labor Industry uh, Look at that regarding that point. Um, Mr. Chair, is that appropriate? I would say my understanding is uh, he's uh, entitled to ask uh, Mr. Roslin, would you, Robertson, would you like to respond? Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know that I fully understand the question, but um, if it speaks to what an apprentice right is with regards to harassment um, while training in an apprenticeship program, those issues certainly can be brought to uh, the department's attention. Um, the director of apprenticeship have the authority to investigate any, cl any claims so the apprenticeship agreement lays out very clearly that employers are prohibited from discriminating and harassing in the workplace. And therefore, if an apprentice, anyone training under the apprenticeship model that is registered with the Department of Labor, those individuals could bring that issue to the attention of the director. They can actually file a complaint and the complaint would be formally investigated. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for answering that. So there is harassment within the affirmative action programs. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair. Mr. Mm -hmm. um, Robertson. Is, is it in our law? Uh, and maybe it would be more appropriate for us to um, address some of these questions offline. Would that be? Uh, thank you, Chair. I just don't feel that isolation is a good thing. I bring information here for the public forum for the leaders to make that decision. If they want to get back to you and copy this committee or copy me and send it to the committee members, uh, that'll be your purview. Uh, one thing I do want to also mention, uh, the affirmative action programs are required to be cited but not posted on websites that are functionally for apprenticeship programs. I think it's essential that people understand the reason they provide that it's required, but don't provide the link. However, they're required to submit them to the, the Minnesota Department of Labor Industry. I'd ask the, the author of the bill, consider amending, uh, considering this as they move ahead, that if, if they're required to, these profits and nonprofits are required to create affirmative action programs, are they going to make sure that they post them online or link to the U.S. The Minnesota Department of Labor Industry, and will they meet the content technology accessibility law that the legislature decided to pass for themselves regarding digital accessibility for their documents? As we all know, the U.S. 
the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry is required to <coughs> follow Minnesota Statute 16E.0 sub, sub, Subdivision 9 on digital accessibility, provide more equal opportunity for everybody with underrepresented individuals. So frankly, it's, it's going to be up to this committee, it's going to be up to the chair to consider as you move that ahead. Last but least, the, uh, the sonar and rule writing process is not fully accessible. I talked to Administrator Ms. Puss some time ago. She's the lead administrator over there, uh, the Department of Administration, which I believe that's the part of the hearing process that you go through. The struck through and underlying language that is always proposed in sonar and rule writing is not accessible regarding struck through and underlying language. You'll find this specifically for the legislature uh, posted on the Data Practice Commission. Uh, there was a uh, correspondence that came from Jason, the reviser, how struck through and underlined in, in the PDFs, which again are only in that format at Department of Administration. How do we know for certain that people are accessing this stuff in a way that's useful, that they can understand it? I think this is relevant as you move ahead on digital accessibility, uh, especially for rule writing, which usually uh, undergirdle our, our statutes and help define for public feedback. But if, if you're not creating fairness in the sonar writing process, and the department's aware of it, and the department administration is aware of it, uh, I never got no feedback uh, from this. And, and it may be off topic, uh, but it does have to do with the last bill, uh, as repealers, et cetera. And uh, I hope, you, hope uh, someone's taken notes and considers to decide to, if the legislature wants to make their stuff they're at least their bills fully accessible. Uh, that these uh, draft bills at, at, the, at, the, uh, at the administration level for rule writing is accessible for those individuals as well. Uh, I'm open to any questions, but again, thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Heller, and I, and I believe you're, this is the apprenticeship committee or the apprenticeship board that's bringing this bill forward, and it's not the EEOC, they're just adopting language, so. Thank you for your testimony. Any uh, further, anybody else in the audience wants to speak for or against uh, this bill? Excuse me, uh, Chair. Mr. Mr. Heller. Um, uh, I can't stress enough that if, if apprenticeship programs are required to have an equal opportunity program based on Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry and now U.S. Department uh, of, of Labor, frankly, uh, Who's checking those for accessibility? How can a person actually find them because they're buried? You need to really think about that process as we connect uh, with the public at large. And, and now the, the third parties are using our state funds indirectly or directly through the uh, grants from the U.S. Department of Labor. Mr. Heller, that's a conversation you can have offline with, with them. This is, that is not pertinent to the bill that we're on right now. Thank you, Mr. Heller. Is there anybody else in the audience who'd like to speak for, speak for against this bill? Any member questions of the, of the bill or of the Representative Vogel? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I guess to uh, Ms. Robertson. So in the testimony I, I, that you presented, I gathered that this was only about discrimination. But now I'm hearing that there's other facets here. Which is it? Is, is this a pretty broad change or is it pretty narrow as you described it? Ms. Robertson. Mr. Chair, Representative, the uh, request before us is only limited to the changes that were made in uh, 29, Section 30, that only speaks to EEOC, EEO. Representative Vogel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, this doesn't have any effect at all on the prevailing uh, wage issues or the ratio changes or anything else that was brought up. This is just that one little narrow thing. Mr. Roberts. Representative, that is correct. Okay. Representative Vogel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm also hearing that there has been some action on it since, so that the federal law would now be different than it was on um, January 18th of 2017, or at least the federal rules. Is that correct or incorrect? Ms. Robinson, I um, is, is the changes that were mentioned that rescinded by the current administration, do that, does that affect the EEOC part that we're dealing with here in this bill? 
Mr. Chair, uh, again, my name is John Aiken. I'm Director of Labor Standards and Apprenticeship for the Department. I'm not aware of, of this particular change. In fact, um, have been working uh, alongside the Office of Apprenticeship at the U.S. Department of Labor over the last year related to the conformity language, um, and it was not brought to my attention if this indeed did occur. Representative Vogel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we can be assured that this is not going to change anything other than the discrimination portions that were uh, in, in the presentation. Um, Mr. Eckler. Mr. Chair, that is correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Representative Fabian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I am a little confused by some of these things, but you just heard the question and the, and the response, um, Chair Sundin, is that is your intention of this bill sync up with the conversation that these two people just had? The intention of the bill is simply a conformity here with uh, federal regulations. I, I, I don't know. You, we were uh, heard about uh, some uh, papers that came down from the federal government that uh, were rescinded, evidently. I don't know. Uh, I never saw those. You never saw those. So I don't have accurate information on that. So. Mr. Fabian, Representative Fabian. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Representative Sundin, would you consider, because we seem to be having some conflicting testimony or at least some conflicting stuff here. Would you consider um, just laying your bill over, bringing it back to the committee after we had clarity on just exactly what was going to be happening here because we've heard what, Cheers. I, just, what, I, what I think to be somewhat different testimony and Chair Nelson, I'm not trying to sabotage anybody's stuff here, okay? I'm just, I think that it's important for us to make sure that we're on the same page. Cheers. And I don't know where we would in, in doing what we do, where we would, if we have more current regulations or laws, why we would not be conforming to those laws rather than going back and picking something from a previous time. So, so that's my... Chair Sunday, my like the question I asked earlier um, about this is we're talking about we're adding some classes to the part for the EOC. That's the only thing this bill is doing. Um, but um, you may, Chair Sunday, if you want to answer Mr. Fabian or Representative Fabian's question, there are several references to uh, uh, prevailing wage, and uh, the, I think the conversation got convoluted away from what we're doing here uh, and. You tried, uh, some people tried to pick up some extra uh, topics here to talk about, and uh, we're not here to talk about them. We're here to talk about the changes in front of us here. I think they're explained quite clearly by the department. Thank you, Representative Fabian. But thank you, yeah, Are you done? Are you done? I'll just look up to see yeah. if you're done, yeah. You're, the, the researcher here's head's in the way. I can't see you. <laughs> 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 anyway, oh, okay. <laughs> any further questions from the members of the committee? If not, um, Chair Sunday, you want to renew your motion? I will renew my motion. I'm going to reflect back on a meeting that I had about 35 years ago with a bunch of fat old white guys in a labor temple. And uh, one fellow says, told, told us, he said, uh, you know, in 30, 40 years from now, this room's going to look a lot different. And this guy was dead right. I went to another labor meeting uh, the other night, and there were uh, probably a quarter of the people in that room were Latino, some of other color, and plenty of females there, too. So I think we're moving in the right direction in the last 40 years. And if this uh, legislation continues that, that would be terrific. Thank you. So, Rep Chair, Chair Sunday, do you want to re renew your I motion? I do renew my motion to send this to the General Register. Thank you. All in favor of the, reg of the, the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. aye. The motion passes. It's gone on your way to the General Register. <coughs> and uh, members, is there anything else? That, uh, Chair Sundin, is there anything else that you need to deal with the committee? Otherwise, we can adjourn. You have the gavel. Uh, we're adjourned. Have a good day, John.